I'm going to start off differently tonight. Simon says, open your Bibles to Acts the 8th chapter. That'll come, you'll know why I said that in just a moment. Uh, it's good to see each one that's here this evening. Appreciate your presence. Um, you know, it is a rainy night. It's a Wednesday night. Um, school kids are tired. Parents are tired. You know, it's uh, middle of the work week. But I appreciate your presence, and it gives me energy to see you here, and I hope that what we do will be profitable. As a child, I think everybody plays Simon Says. Um, You know, I played it, played it with my kids. Um, I have to admit, I was not the best at that game because... Well, I can't figure out for sure. It was either I'm not very good at paying attention or I don't like taking orders or maybe a little of both, you know. But, uh, you know, the game of Simon Says, everybody's familiar with. I'm not going to play Simon Says with you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and turn around or touch your head. But I use that as a way of, I want you to associate from this day forward, Acts chapter 8 with Simon Saul. You know, Simon Saul. And that, by the way, is a picture of exactly what Simon looked like. Uh, you know, tongue-in-cheek, of course. That, some artist rendition of Simon of Acts the 8th chapter. But he saw some important things that are not a game. And I want us to see the same things that Simon saw. Because what he saw was very important. And the background of this, of course, is what Aaron read for us a little while ago. It's what we talked about Sunday morning. The great persecution that arose following the death of Stephen, it results in the disciples being scattered. And one of the disciples that scattered is a man named Philip. One of the seven that was chosen in Acts the sixth chapter. And he went up to Samaria, and there he preached the word. He preached Christ and his authority. And it resulted in, it tells us in verse 12, both men and women being baptized. Now what I'd like to do is I want to focus in on one of those people that was baptized. But we got to go back and read, starting at verse 4, to see the things that Simon saw. Verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him, because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Simon becomes a Christian. Well, I could say that one of the things that he saw is the necessity of baptism. But we talked about that Sunday. But I have three things I believe he saw that I want to talk about tonight. Simon saw genuine miracles. And I, you know, I didn't want to put too much there for those taking notes but the idea is he saw genuine miracles as opposed to the kind of trickery he had been performing 
He saw genuine miracles as opposed to what some try to pass off as miracles today. I mean, you look at this man and he claimed, verse 9, that he was someone great. He had practiced sorcery. He was a magician. You may, some of you with really good eyes can see the M-A-G, the magus. The, he was Simon, sometimes called Simon Magus. He, he was a sorcerer. You know, magicians today, they, they, they understand, everybody understands, it's sleight of hand, it, it's all, you know, distracting you to look over here while the hand works here. But men like Simon, they claim they actually had powers. They had these great powers, and in fact, people called him the great power of God. That's some pretty heady praise. But he sees what Philip does. And verse 13 says, he was amazed. He saw the difference. You know, I don't know exactly what Simon the magician, Simon the sorcerer did. But what he did is he came to a point where he was like the magicians of Egypt. Do you remember when the plague started and the water was turned to blood and they, they performed an imitation of that? And then the frogs came up on the land and they did an imitation of that. And then here come the lice and they finally they looked at Pharaoh and they said, this is the finger of God. Uh, this is, you know, it's not that Aaron and Moses are better magicians than us. You know, we can't do this kind of stuff. Simon saw something different. First century miracles were so different from what people try to pass off today as miracles. You know, chapter 4, verse 16, you remember when Peter and John had been arrested, they were put outside the council, and this is what the Jewish leaders said, verse 16, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. First century miracles were not explainable by anything other than it's a miracle. The enemies had to concede it. You look back there at chapter 3 as just the one example. Here is a man, everyone knew who he was. He was laid daily at the gate. This is a man who's been lame since birth. Can you imagine the condition of the muscles, the tendons, everything in his legs when he's never walked and he's over 40 years old? But what does it say he did? Now, Peter and John don't force him to his feet, help him to walk, took him by the hand, said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he walks, he leaps, he jumps. He can do it. It was indisputable. If you have ever watched so-called healers of today, it is vastly different. Oftentimes it will be ailments that you can't even see. They, I, have, I have witnessed watching on television some of them take somebody that was unable to walk and they would tell them, throw away those crutches and, and you know, you'd see the person sort of stagger a few steps and there's always an aid then to kind of help them. It's a miracle, he can walk. No, he still can't walk without help. And most people don't know who this was, anything about him. It was different. And there's something else different that Simon saw. He saw that these men are not in it for the money. I'm going to come back to verse 14 a little later on. But the apostles in Jerusalem hear about all this. And they send Peter and John down there. And Simon decides that he would like the same powers that Peter and John had. 
And so he offered money in verse 18, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could not be purchased, that you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You remember back in chapter 3 how Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have. Chapter 3, verse 6. We see today those men who pass themselves off as healers and some women also, they typically live a pretty nice lifestyle. I mean, when you have your own Gulfstream jet, that's generally considered a nice lifestyle, I would guess. You know, but I mean, these men very much enrich themselves. Peter and John, when they were offered money, Peter was very, who said, your money perish with you. I'm not taking this from you. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 4, and I don't think we appreciate this. Or I, don't, I shouldn't say we. I don't always appreciate this the way I should. We talk about Paul, that great apostle, and we think of all the wonderful things these men did. Yes, we know they suffered some. And, but I think we forget sometimes just where they stood in the scheme of things in the first century. Verse 9, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Let me just say, in verse 10, he's using a bit of sarcasm with them as they thought of themselves as so wise. And Paul said, here we are, the apostles, and people treating us like fools. People treating us as weak. And dishonored. But oh you, you're, you're strong and distinguished and wise. To the present hour we both hunger and thirst. And we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands. Being reviled we bless. Being persecuted we endure. Being defamed we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world. The offscouring of all things until now. Simon clearly saw that what Peter, or well, what Peter, John, what Philip could do was different than anything he had been doing. And I hope we can see that it was different than things being passed off as miracles today. I hope we also see their motives were very different. They were never about enriching themselves. I mean, you think about, you can heal the sick. You can make the lame to walk. You genuinely could do that. And yet, you're homeless. You're poor. You're, you're all these things. Clearly, they weren't in it for that. Don't be fooled by these so-called healers of today something else Simon saw is how these miraculous gifts came about I want to take you back to something and we've I know we've talked about some of these at least briefly before but in Acts 2 and verse 38 the crowd when they said men and brethren what shall we do they were given instruction repent and be baptized and promises were given You'll receive the remission of sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everyone that was told to repent and be baptized was promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. And yet, there is a consistency in the next few chapters of saying that signs and wonders were done through the hands of the apostles. Not the 3,000 disciples who've just been made. 
Look at verse 43 of the second chapter. Fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Not through the church as a whole. Through the apostles. In the fourth chapter, in verse 33, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Chapter 5, verse 12, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. At least these three times, he specifically says, through the apostles. And then we come to the middle part of the sixth chapter, and suddenly we have Stephen, who is doing, verse 8, great wonders and signs among the people. And he's not an apostle. There was a Philip that was an apostle, but the Philip that goes to Samaria is not an apostle. And he's doing great signs and wonders. Why do we have in chapters 2, 4, and 5, specifically saying each time through the apostles, and now suddenly we've got two other men who are not apostles. Well, let's look at what Simon said that he saw. Verse 14. Now when the apostles, this is back to chapter 8. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. He saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Spirit was given. Galatians 5, starting verse 24, talks about the fruit of the Spirit. There are many ways in which a life manifests that God's Spirit is in them. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Simon didn't see as the apostles laid their hands on, oh, suddenly they've got love and joy and peace. What he saw was some kind of miraculous thing. And he said, I want that kind of power. Go back to the sixth chapter. When the seven have been chosen, they were set before the apostles. Said, And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. The same thing that's said in Acts 8. They prayed that the Spirit would come. It said then they laid hands on them. And Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, this power was given. Through the first eight chapters, 14 men have been said to work miracles. The 12 apostles and two men upon whom hands were laid. Look at the 19th chapter of Acts. When Paul has come to Ephesus and he finds these men, he calls them, he calls them disciples, and yet they had only received John's baptism. Verse 5, after telling them about Jesus, it said when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. What happens here in chapter 19? What Simon saw in Acts 8, that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, things happen. This is just one more evidence. The so-called miracles of today just don't compare to the miracles of the New Testament. There's no one today upon whom the apostles have laid hands. 
Simon would be able to see that these things were not real. But let's go back to Acts 8 and see one final thing he saw that day. And this one's important. He saw the danger of falling. Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, so he offers money. He says, give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there there have been some times when I've gotten worked up in my preaching. I've done a little shouting. One time I got so worked up, I hit the pulpit real hard and pretty sure I cracked my hand. Um, I never went to a doctor because doctors charge money, you know. And, uh, but, you know, it, it only hurt for months afterwards, you know. So, you know, I, I've gotten worked up a few times. But I'm not sure I've ever in the pulpit talked the way Peter talks in these next few verses. Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. The words of Peter are strong here. And I think about Simon. Now here is a guy who has been going around the city with people saying he is the great power of God. Would that maybe fill you with pride? I mean, he knows he's a trickster. But that's some pretty heady praise. And now all that's gone. You know, does he want it back for the power, the fame, for the ability to make some money off of it? I don't know. But I know this. He's not simply a misguided convert. You know, sometimes you may teach somebody the gospel. You teach them about Jesus. You teach them what it says about repentance and baptism. And they become a Christian. And they generally want to be a Christian. And yet, they've got all this baggage with them. And they will say something or do something. And at first, it just floors you because you go, wow, Uh, Christians don't do that, you know, and you try to talk to them. But it's the innocent mistake of somebody that doesn't know. That's not how Peter treated this. He, you know, besides the strong, your money perish with you. He says your heart is not right in the sight of God. And it's not an innocent mistake. He said you're to repent of this wickedness. He said, you are poisoned by bitterness. You are bound by iniquity. He says, Simon, your heart is in a terrible place. Now, let's ask ourselves a question. And it's an easy one to answer. Is Simon a saved man at this point? Would you describe a man who... The apostle says, your money perish with you. Your heart's not right with God. You're poisoned by bitterness. You're bound by iniquity. You're guilty of wickedness. You know, no, that's not a saved person. But I've lost track of how many times I've read and heard over the years. Well, see, Simon never was saved. Simon never was a true convert. Well, I want you to read 12 and 13 with me again. And I want you to remember, this is the account of Luke that is written at least 20 years after this incident occurs. 
at least 20 years later, he writes it knowing full well what Simon is going to do later. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Knowing what Simon does, you know, sometime later, and this would be, a, there'd be a little bit of a period of time because word has to reach Jerusalem. Then the apostles have to travel up there. You know, how does Luke describe it? Simon himself also believed. He doesn't say Simon pretended to be a believer. Simon saw that this is what er the direction everybody was going in, and so Simon, you know, he just jumped on the bandwagon. If Simon didn't believe, then did the Samaritans believe? Because it looks to me as though he puts the faith of Simon on the same level with that of the other Christians in there. Yes, what happens? It's not that Simon never believed. It's that Simon fell. That Simon did not continue in his faith. He did not guard his heart. We need to see that there is a danger of falling. Last week, I took you to the book of Romans and focused on encouragement and comfort that's found in that book. And I tried to point out, this is comfort in Christ. The, the message last week was intended to be one of encouragement. So I didn't read passages like chapter 14. In verse 15, when he's discussing the meats offered to idols, and he says, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food... You are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. If the doctrine of once saved, always saved is true. And that's the view of the majority of folks that live around us. That once you're a true Christian, you can never be lost. If that's true, how would you destroy one of your fellow believers? Come down to verse 19. Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. It gives them two choices. You can pursue peace and try to build your fellow Christian up or you can destroy him. He's telling him, don't do that. But the point I want us to see and I hope we can see what Simon saw is that a Christian can be destroyed. He can be destroyed by the, own, the corruptions he allows into his heart, sometimes by the actions of others. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, you have one of those chapters or a section, I just want the first 13 verses. I don't know how you understand this. If you think the doctrine of once saved, always saved is true. I mean, what point is he trying to make? Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Now just pause. Baptized, spiritual food, spiritual drink. They are partaking 
he says, of that spiritual rock, it's Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained. And were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands. Take heed lest he fall. If you can't fall from grace. If it is an impossibility. What is Paul saying here? Here he said is Israel baptized into Moses. And the obvious is, and you were baptized into Christ. They didn't make it to their promised land. They didn't enter their inheritance because they were fornicators and these other things he speaks of, idolaters, Take heed lest you fall. Now, I believe in the possibility of apostasy. I don't believe in the necessity of apostasy. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You don't have to fall from grace. Simon saw the danger of falling from grace as he did and was told to repent. Pray God. We need to realize that it may be common doctrine around here, but it's not the apostles' doctrine One last passage on this falling from grace. Hebrews 10. I I find in preaching, and I think most preachers would probably tell you this, sometimes you're guilty of letting the pendulum swing too far one direction. It's hard to keep that balance. You know, that you, you... You see things and you get concerned about it and you start preaching all these warnings and all these negatives and all this against sin. Or then sometimes you see that people are discouraged and beaten down and you you, you get to preaching about hope and encouragement and and the next thing you know, people are getting lax. You know, you know, trying to find that balance between folks living in fear and living in overconfidence. It's a tough one. But Hebrews 10 has some of the most sobering words you can ever read. And I think that sometimes I don't sound this warning enough. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, verse 26, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people." It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I don't want to have to preach that every week. I want to be able to do lessons like I did last Wednesday evening and talk about encouragement and hope in the book of Romans. 
But let's never lose sight of this. That if we sin willfully, there's no other sacrifice. Catch the very end of this 10th chapter. Verse 38 says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Let's be those people. Simon saw the danger. He said, pray to God that these things don't come upon me. Let's be aware of the danger that we might live diligently, that we might live carefully before our God. Simon says is a fun game. But what Simon saw is serious business. I want us to see through the claims of the so-called miracle workers of today. Not only is it important that we understand they're not working true miracles. They're not preaching the true gospel. We need to see that. We need to take heed lest we fall. We need to be a people of diligence. God has given us, Romans 8, everything that we need to fight that good fight, to run that race with endurance. But if we become lax and careless, we will drift away. Let's not allow that to happen. We're going to sing a song for your encouragement. And if you've never done what needs to be done in order to stand in Christ, Simon saw the danger of falling. You can't fall from grace if you're never in grace. And if you're outside of the grace of God, we would beg you this evening to hear his word, believe it, and be baptized. If we can help you, you come as we stand and sing together. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.